Hi, I'm Nate Adams. Welcome back to the third piece of the Electrify Everything course. And we're going to talk about what size panel do you need? A uh, really common question, a uh, very important question. Uh, and I tend to think in heuristics. I try to think of ways to simplify making a decision one way or another. And so I'm going to walk you through how I think of sizing panels. And this is not the correct way to do it, so I call it non-kosher. This is a shortcut. Uh, but uh, it's one way to get a pretty good idea of whether you need to upgrade or not. Because uh, it's it's not a cheap upgrade to do. I'll talk about it later. It's like three to six thousand dollars, depending on the complexity of the the project and where you are. Uh, you know, more expensive markets are going to be more expensive. All right, and again, this is the third piece of the Electrify Everything course. And so, for starters, you want to go in your basement or go outside or wherever your main breaker is. Um, and see what size it is. So it's either going to be 100, 150, or 200, um, unless you happen to have one of the, the few houses out there with a 400 amp service. But uh, if you do, your house is probably you know 5,000 square feet or more, and you've got multiple systems. Um, so the good news is 200 amps works for most houses, and it's not that hard to get done. And here's what I mean when I say that. So uh, 200 amps will run one central HVAC system. So it depends on the house, but uh, uh, we find somewhere in the three to 4,000 square foot range is where most builders start moving to using two HVAC systems. And it's mainly about the backup heat, which we'll get to later, uh, the resistance heat. Uh, but uh, this will run one system, no problem. And then it will run a couple of EVs and then it'll run the rest of the house. And the other good news is that 100 amps is oftentimes enough to do it. So we have done 13 electrifications, and two of them were on 100 amp panels. I think we only did upgrades in two or three others. Everybody else had 200 amps already. Uh, so this can work. And I'm not the only one saying that this can work. So uh, John Semelhack, who's a, a good buddy of mine, and you want to follow him on Twitter, uh, he is out there also doing electrifications. Uh, he does more new build than retrofits, but we, we have fun competing with each other and busting each other's chops. Uh, so he has an all-electric house in, and then also a, uh, an apartment for his mom or mother-in-law. Um, and all of that fits on a 200 amp panel, and he hasn't broken 50% of load. So that's a 200 amp, but there you go. That's, that's actually two HVAC systems, and it's working. Um, and then Paul, who, if I am correct, wrote a book on residential energy efficiency, uh, but I know that he watches his usage very, very closely. So he only has a 100 amp service. Um, and so he's getting there, and like you said, he, he rarely breaks 5 kilowatts, which is 5,000 watts. And we're going to be thinking in watts here. That is the easiest way to get this done. Um, so let's dig into the non-kosher method. So, uh, again, heuristics. If you take 100 amps times 220 volts, um, that gives you 22,000 watts is the maximum you can pull on a 100 amp breaker. Uh, now, technically, they're supposed to allow more before they trip. So, this is not perfect. Again, non-kosher. Hear me. Um, but 22,000 watts is the high end of what you want to do with 100 amps. 200 amps, you double that, you get to about 44,000. And by the way, I'll give you a link to the right way to do this at the end. But for starters, this will get your, your head working on it. Uh, so what you do is you want to add up how many watts things you use at your house if everything was on at the same time, which is not going to happen much, if at all, uh, when you look at everything. So if you can stay under 22,000 watts, um, you can use a 100 amp panel. Or you might be able to use, I should say. Um, I feel like I need to put in the, this is not investment advice kind of thing. Um, it, it, get local boots on the, the ground help with this. But this is meant to, again, be a heuristic for you. So I don't like putting a ton of stuff on slides, but uh, I'm breaking that for this. So let's take a look at a bunch of different appliances and how much they pull. So a standard electric resistance dryer pulls 4,500 watts when it's running. An induction stove pulls between four and 6,000 watts max, uh, so that would be the oven and burners running, uh, so keep that in mind. On-demand electric water heaters, we are not big fans of these, and you will see why. So 
if, if you run one that is large enough to actually do uh, two showers simultaneously, it's going to be 20,000 watts. You only have 22 on a 100 amp panel. So uh, it, it, you don't want to do that. A resistance tanked water heater, um, so plain old electric resistance tank is 4,500 watts. Heat pump water heaters are amazing here. They only pull four to 600 watts. So they run longer, but they don't pull much when they're running. And we're concerned about peak more so than uh, usage on this. Uh, and they, they also use um, two thirds or even three quarters less energy than either of these two to get their job done. Uh, central heat pumps and just heat pumps in general, they are basically a thousand watts per ton. So if you have a two ton, that's 2000 watts. If you have a five ton, which is the largest standard uh, residential one that will pull about 5,000 watts when it's running. If you have variable speed equipment though, it will run uh, considerably less power than that. Uh, but that's what you want to keep in mind. Backup resistance heat for when it's really cold or the compressor goes out, things like that. Uh, on the small side, it's going to be 5 kW or 5,000 watts or up to a 20 kW or 20,000 watts. So this right here, this line item, is basically what is going to decide what size panel you need. This is the most important one because this is legitimately going to run for some time uh, in most homes. EV chargers, they're going to vary between 3,000 watts and 20,000 watts, and you want to watch what you're doing there depending on your panel size. Hot tubs pull a ton, four to 6,000 watts, and they run a lot. So I, I've seen hot tubs add 5,000 kilowatt hours a year to client bills here in Cleveland. And it's not that uncommon to see houses where all of their electric use for normal stuff, so refrigerator, lights, um, appliances, all that stuff, comes in at 5,000 uh, kilowatt hours. So hot tubs use a ton of energy, and they use it all the time, uh, at least whenever it's cold out. So uh, you want to keep that in mind. That may necessitate a 200 amp panel. Well pumps, if you are like me and live in the country, and uh, have well water, those pull a pretty good chunk. Always on, which I'm borrowing from Sense uh, Energy Monitor, you're usually, you're always going to have 200 to 1,000 watts going in your house, depending on your habits. Computers, a laptop's 50, a uh, desktop is 500, uh, if it's like a gaming computer. Uh, and this is probably clear by now, but 1,000 watts is known as a KW or a kilowatt. So when you see that, elsewhere that'll go. But watts are definitely the easiest way to think about all of this and it's what energy monitors um, measure which is what we'll look at. So speaking of looking at it let's look at a 100 amp upgrade that we did for a client. So in this case it was a bunch of condos put together and the main line was underneath the slab of the slab house and then ran underneath the, um, the garage floor and then popped up and the breaker was on the other side. So there was no easy way to upgrade this. Um, and so we discussed it and looked at it and decided to just stick with 100 amp. So here's what she has in her house. So she has an electric dryer, she has an induction stove, she has a heat pump water heater, uh, she has a two ton heat pump, she has a kind of small uh, backup strip, which is perfect for ha her house because it's only 1,200 square feet and it's got a pretty low load, so that's more than she needs. Um, she has an EV charger for her Chevy Volt, and her always-on is about 200 watts. She really sips energy. So the worst case total, if you add all these up, is in the 25,000 watt range. So yes, that breaks the 22, but let's talk more about that. So here's the but. Realistic peak is more like 15,000. So these are the things that might actually be hitting all at the same time. Uh, it would be the electric dryer, the induction stove, and the backup resistance. But these are not going to run for long, and they're probably not going to run all at the same time. Like the backup resistance, you need that on really cold nights. So uh, if that's going to be kicking, it's probably going to be kicking between, say, 2 a.m. and 7 a.m., uh, so you may be able to avoid that, and then you just have to be careful running uh, other appliances. Uh, but here's a really key point. So at the bottom there, note the heat pump water heater is clutch. 
in doing this because if we had the 4,500 watts electric resistance tank, there'd be real danger of actually pegging the, the 22,000. Uh, so to be clear, the heat pump water heaters, and we'll be talking about this in one of the other uh, sections, they are electric resistance tanks. They just have a heat pump on top. So it can run the resistance electric. That's the backup should the heat pump fail. Uh, but uh, in general, those are only gonna pull four to 600 watts. So uh, realistically, these are the three things that are quite likely to run at the same time. Her heat pump water heater, the heat pump, and the EV charger. Uh, so, you know, it's a, an electric car with a 3KW charger is going to take, you know, it could be a, a couple of hours, it could be eight hours, it might even be 12 hours to fully charge, depending on what it is. This is a Volt, so it, it only has about a 10 kilowatt hour battery, uh, and so it doesn't take that long to charge that. Now the keys if you want to run on a 100 amp panel is you need to run a 10 kW backup resistance strip maximum. That's your limit. That's all you can really do. Uh, you need to run a heat pump water heater pretty much for sure and you need to stay on the small side for your EV charger. You may need to stick to 110 even. 110 pulls about 1500 watts or 1.5 kW. So let's look at data from this electrification. So uh, when I was pulling these slides together, I just went in. This is uh, her Sense Energy Monitor. We aren't using these nearly as much anymore because they aren't very good at catching variable loads. But their app is still hands down the best of anyone out there. And uh, uh, it's a very fast install. So if you're nervous about something, this is a nice product to use. Uh, but right here you can see this is her heat pump turning on. This is what an inverter variable speed heat pump looks like when they kick on. So see it ramps up, um, but it ramps up pretty gradual. And if you look at a single stage or a two stage, they just go bang and they, it'll be a big spike come up and come back down uh, and then go. That can be pretty hard on a bunch of things. Uh, but inverters start up slow, and you can see it just kind of gradually increases how much it's pulling. There's a number of reasons for that. And then she had something that she turned on here. So uh, she peaked at 3,200 watts. Um, so what you need to do then, if you're going to look at this from a data perspective, you want to keep zooming out so that you can see what the real peak is. And th this is, again, doing this posthumously because... Uh, we, we know what the house is using. And so 7,200 watts is what her peak was in the 24 hours when I was looking at this. And then I backed up to look at uh, an entire month and her peak was 9,400. So again, 22,000 is our max. She's not even getting beyond half that uh, with how the house is operating. And this is another screen from Sense that's really nice. They let you compare how you're doing to other users. So notice other sense homes in Ohio, about 2,200 watts on average they're pulling. She is pulling about 1,350. This is stinking amazing. Um, so uh, she's naturally a frugal person and she's frugal with her energy. So um, uh, th this is pretty much our best electrification example right now. Uh, but uh, 1,350 watts on average, and that's really pretty crazy because you can bet this average is in houses that have furnaces. Um, so they're using gas and electric. This is just all electric, and she has an electric car and drives almost all of her miles uh, on electric. So it's technically it's, it's a hybrid, but um, the volts mainly run on electric. So in last month, she used about 1,100 kilowatt hours. This is December of 2020. Now this is uh, our most energy intensive electrification. This is about a 3,000 square foot split level and uh, uh, also has an EV and we sized this heat pump very aggressively so it runs a fair amount of resistance electric. Uh, but you can see she is averaging 5,500 watts. Um, so that is considerably more than the average. And she also has a pretty big solar system. She's got about a 15 kW system, which in the wintertime, they really suck wind here, uh, particularly if there's any snow. Uh, so in December, she used about 3,800 kilowatt hours. Um, so that was an expensive 
uh, month, uh, but it averages out over the year, which is really important to note. So if you're nervous about some of the big bills, there's a bunch of different ways you can deal with that, uh, but uh, going on budget billing can be really helpful. So let's look at another month. So here's September, and again, this is her EV. This is everything in the house. This is air conditioning, heat. You know, this is everything. She used 950 kilowatt hours uh, for September, um, and then her solar system was producing well at that point. So she got 1,265 kilowatt hours. Uh, so this is a nice piece of uh, the Sense app. Now the kosher method, I just want to refer you here so that once you watch this, if, if you want to go through and, and do the, the math the, the right way, um, which should be easier to do now that you understand this, but uh, I look at the kosher method and I just get annoyed, frankly. Um, like That just sounds like a pain in the neck. Um, uh, so are, uh, do we have good odds of being able to use 100 amp or do we need to upgrade and you can just add up? what appliances the, the house is going to get and getting an idea. But uh, John Harrod wrote this great article at Green Building Advisor, and it's Does Your Electrification Project Require a Service Upgrade? If you are at all in doubt, unless you have a giant house with a whole bunch of HVAC systems, 200 amps is going to do the job. Just put one in. So you're looking at three to six grand, like I mentioned earlier, and that runs one HVAC system with backup resistance that'll run up to about 20 kW, which is the most you're going to put in. So that will usually handle up to 4,000 square feet, give or take, um, 3,000 quite easily. Uh, it depends on your climate and how tight your house is and a bunch of other things. Uh, but uh, that will also run two EVs. You know, it'll run three or four if you need to. Cause it, very seldom are you going to come home with two completely drained electric cars. Um, you may have one that's really drained, but the other one probably only needs, you know, a, a quarter charge, something like that. Um, and so you can share. The, the chargers are smart like that, or many of them are, to where they will balance what is needed. And then, of course, that'll run the rest of the house. So uh, this is a common thing to keep in mind. Do you need a sub-panel? So a sub-panel is this little panel that is on the right that I put an arrow on top of it. And uh, so if you are out of breaker space, which is pretty common, that doesn't mean you have to upgrade the panel to a larger size or even change that panel. Um, it just means you need to add a sub-panel that has space for more breakers, which is what is happening here. So you use two breaker spaces in this panel and then you run it over to this. So you can actually see down here is where they, they ran it. You got the big red and the black coming off for a 100 amp sub-panel. Uh, and we'll talk about this in one of the other pieces, but a 100 amp sub-panel is kind of ideal for a garage because then you can run a bunch of EVs off of that. And if you happen to be a welder or something like that, you can, you can run that too. Uh, but a sub-panel can oftentimes save you from having to do big upgrades if your main breaker is big enough to be able to do the job. And another thing that I highly recommend is decide with data. Um, anybody that has followed me for any length of time knows that we look for every possible way to measure stuff because you never know what you're going to learn. It always cracks me up when somebody's like, well, what are you going to learn when you try this? Like, I don't know. I'm just going to go measure it. We'll see what comes up. Um, and you always learn stuff. So, um, even if you do this before your electrification, um, the Emporia View, this is a really nice little product, um, but it lets you see what your peaks are. And uh, up until now, it, any of these monitors that uh, had a bunch of separate CTs, current transmitter uh, clamps, that's what these are here, any of these that were out there started at 600 bucks. So that was part of the reason we use Sense is it's 300 so it was the, the least expensive option. Uh, but Sense does not do a good job of picking up variable speed loads. Um, so like we use variable speed heat pumps and I can't see them and it's annoying. Um, it missed my car quite a bit. Um, uh, so I, I sadly had to sell it um, when we switched to something we could pull our camper with, but I had a Chevy Volt and it was really fun to watch that, uh, see what it was using and uh, learn a bunch of things from watching it. But I could watch it with this, however the sense did not pick the car up most of the time. 
It only picked up maybe half the usage, and it took it about a year to find it. Uh, so uh, this is now the least expensive option out there. It's 100 to 150 bucks. Um, uh, it's 100 bucks for one that has eight of these, and it's 150 for one that has 16. And they just added voltage monitoring, which they didn't have in the first generation. So it didn't know if you were running 115 volts or 125 volts, and those are you know in the normal range. So it could throw uh, the accuracy off. Uh, but they have added that for the second generation as of a couple months ago. So it seems like with everything electric, there are really good options coming out. And this is another hole that is now filled. And by the way, it, this is the only affiliate thing I'm going to have in here. Uh, but uh, like I said, it's 100 to 150 bucks. If you use the code Nate the House Whisperer, uh, you get 5% off and then I get a 5% cut. So uh, if you find value from this and you're going to buy one of those anyway, just type in Nate the House Whisperer. You'll save a couple bucks and then I get a couple too. So thank you in advance. Um, and so that's that's it. The non-kosher method. That's basically add up what you got. So for a 100 amp panel, uh, 22,000 watts max and uh, 10 kW heat strip max. For a 200 amp panel, you need to uh, stay under 44,000, and that's going to handle the vast majority of houses in the U.S. because um, the vast majority are under 3,000 square feet uh, and have one HVAC system. And even if you have two, so like say you have an upstairs downstairs and you're in North Carolina or something like that, if you stay under, if you put two 5 kW heat strips on each one of those, you're under 10 kW. So you may still be able to make that work. Although uh, most houses are going to have two systems are probably new enough that they have a 200 amp anyway. And that's that. So uh, if you happen to find this video by accident and you aren't part of the Electrify Everything course, I'll be putting a link below, just as I will have a link for uh, the Emporium view. So I hope this is helpful. Thanks for coming through the third part of the Electrify Everything course, and I'll see you next time. I'm Nate Adams.